I think a lot of people think that Alaska is out of reach because it's expensive, you need to get a guide, it's so far away, it's so foreign to so many people, and I get a lot of those feelings, but if you do your research and you do a little bit of planning and you, you just get ready for this thing, you can do it on your own. You and me, brother. We did it. <laughs> we freaking did it. Well, we just want to take a second just to thank everybody before we start um, for tuning in and watching the project and also thanking our partners and the team for everybody's contributions to it. Um, it was a ton of fun to make and it was a ton of fun to go to Alaska and hunt caribou. And um, I think I'll have to go back sometime, so. Yeah, it was kind of a lifelong dream of mine to get up there and uh, have this film actually turn into something pretty cool. It's just icing on the cake for me. So thank you everyone that watched it and a lot of kind words, it was super cool. But we've gotten a lot of questions regarding all these different aspects of the project, whether it was production, to the gear, costs, and uh, all these different things. So we thought we'd make a video going over all these different things to try to make it so we can really show you that there's no case for you not to go try something like this on your own. Um, but I think it's important to mention that, I don't know, Joe, are you an expert on caribou hunting? Yeah, so we're basically just gonna go over our experience with this and some of the questions that we got and a perspective from someone just kind of jumping into this blind. We've never been to Alaska. We've never seen caribou before. So don't take this as gospel that we know what we're talking about. This is just our experience. So yeah, we're, we've done this one time. <laughs> we are by no means experts on this. Um, but we, we thought we'd go over a couple different things, whether it's like the logistics, the essential gear you needed, um, different fears or things we thought about prior to going or what we, we experienced while we were out there, um, camera gear, and then also like some questions that we've gotten on social and stuff about various different things that we thought we'd go over. So um, we might as well uh, jump into it. And just to start, like what were even our your motivations to wanting to do a hunt like this? So Alaska's kind of everyone's North Star in a way where that's, Every hunter wants to go to Alaska at some point, and I've dreamed of this since I was in third grade, going up there and doing some hunting. Um, obviously, I got really big into the Western stuff a few years ago, and just wanted to kind of take that one step further and start trying some things that made me uncomfortable again, where I've never been here before, I've never seen a caribou, never hunted the tundra, and do something in a way where we could do it on our own still. Now I've want to go back there and do some other things that do require a guide, but caribou doesn't require a guide. Um, along with another uh, another list of animals in Alaska that you don't need a guide for as a non-resident. So, um, I think it's important to mention here too, like we've gotten a lot of questions about, um, like I thought you needed a guide to go to Alaska. I thought Alaska was like expensive because I needed a guide and transport and all these things. There's actually a lot of opportunity in Alaska that does not require a guide or being transported in the middle of nowhere by planes and boats and stuff. like. Yeah. Like there's plenty of opportunities that an average guy or someone with a little bit of planning and forethought can go to Alaska and have a ton of fun without really breaking the bank. For sure. Yeah, there's a number of species. There's awesome fishing opportunities. There's caribou, black, black bear, black tail. You can go moose hunting by yourself. You don't need a guide to go up there and do it. Um, there's obviously species that you do like sheep and goat and grizzly bear and things like that. But for someone that wants to just save up a little money and go after it and get it done there's more opportunity up there than what you could tackle in a lifetime so we could just jump right into something like the logistics that went into like there's like, there is a little bit of planning that you have to think about or set up before you can go and take on a project like this or go on a hunt like this because um, it's just there's a little bit of complexity like you have to fly to alaska you have to get a vehicle you have to drive all the way up the dalton highway to the arctic and then wherever you're deciding to hunt along that 414 mile stretch you have to like think about these things and plan out fuel stops and all that. So we'll just talk about like our logistics and our experience that we went through and how we went about it. So hopefully it can show you some of the errors or issues or or maybe th help you think about it more because someone else has done it. So And keep in mind too, there's other places that you can hunt caribou by yourself. This is just specific to our trip. I can't speak to anything else because I've never done it. But. Yeah, we only did the Dalton Highway caribou hunt. Um, so the first thing we had to think about is like flights. Obviously there's a little bit of complexity with the flights. Like we had to fly from Grand Rapids to Minneapolis, which was like the connector or like our hub for our flight or our airline. And then we flew from Minneapolis to Fairbanks. And like the primary reason we flew to Fairbanks, it was the closest um, internet, like big, high, big um, airport that set us in a really nice proximity to where the Dalton Highway was. So we weren't adding extra time by flying to like Anchorage. Yeah, so the flights were slightly cheaper to go into Anchorage, but it would add six hours to our trip and another 
250 280 miles something like that don't quote me on that but it the the easiest way if you're going to go hunt that specific area if you're going to hunt the dalton highway if you're going to hunt that arctic um fly into fairbanks there is an opportunity to fly straight up into Peru bay it's expensive and it's kind of a nightmare because once you get up there there's a lot of supplies that you need to fly with you can't just go up there and buy it um there's not much in uh, Prudhoe Bay. So, so the, the the big thing too about like with the flights is like you need to be cognizant about and we we weren't um, about you yeah. weren't okay uh, <laughs> with how you get your equipment and gear there. Um, so like Delta and like airlines in general usually have like a fifty pound or some type of measurement for how much your bags are allowed to weigh for your stow bags, um, and it's way cheaper to do like three, four, five bags underneath fifty pounds. Uh, rather than like two that are over 50 pounds. Um, so I had my two Pelican cases and my hunting bag plus my like personal item. Um, and my two Pelican cases for camera gear were well with under 50 pounds, which are totally affordable bags to take on. But my one hunting case with like my tripod, all my gear, my boots, all my, my equipment, camo, rain gear, all of my various activities, my pack, all that stuff was like 90 pounds and it was fairly expensive it was over two hundred dollars each way just for that bag i didn't have a whole lot of opportunity to like change that up because these are the bags i had this is how i could get it all there and it all kept it contained and whatnot but joe had a little bit like had the opportunity to break up his bags a little bit better and try to get close to that 50 pound mark so Mm -hmm. it's way more effective or cost effective and um so i'll let you share your experience on packing i've flown a few times now to go out on these hunts and i've got it pretty dialed down to like if i go to montana pretty spot on with what I need to take. Um, It's not a whole lot different with this, but there are a few other items that I needed for this hunt that I wouldn't for a a Western elk hunt. Um, What I did basically is I had, since we were hunting the archery corridor, I took a bow and then I always took a rifle if we were to hike outside the five mile corridor like we did. Um, So I had a bow case, a gun case, and then a big plastic tote that was just full of gear and I zip tied and taped that shut. That I had my carry on. So, um, one thing to know is that they typically aren't going to weigh your carry on. As long as it fits the dimensions that lets it go in an overhead bin, you can make that thing as heavy as you want. You can fill up a lead if you wanted to. Um, but everything else has to be under 50 pounds. So, my bow case, I take the center divider out. It's a SKB double bow case and put my bow in there, pack it full of clothes, other soft items close it and get it right to 50. Same with my gun case, my rifle's in there, some optics are in there, battery packs are in there. Um, Anything else that's heavy and skinny, I try to get in that rifle case, get that right to 50 pounds. And then I have this tote, which is like half the size of this table by 15 inches tall. And everything else gets crammed into there and I pray that that one's under 50. And then I zip tie it and tape it and get it ready to roll. So that one was I think 54, so they dinged me a little bit on that, but um, it still was considerably cheaper than that's. So more bags, keep them sub 50 pounds if you can. It's also like when we say like weigh your stuff, like get one of those like little luggage weighers and then you can like weigh all your stuff before you go to the airport. So you're not doing like the, the shuffle, the shuffle right. at the airport yeah. because it'll be a nightmare. Yeah. Um, so then after we got there and got all our gear there, the next big hassle, and we were fairly concerned with this before getting there was the rental truck. So if you know anything about the environment for rental vehicles, especially Western hunters or Midwest hunters that are trying to go out to different states and get pickup trucks and other various vehicles to go on hunts, or even if you're vacationing, like it's incredibly difficult to get rental vehicles right now because all of these rental companies have actually sold their inventory off um, because they're worth so much right now because of the market's screwed. Right. Um, and so there actually isn't a lot of inventory to rent vehicles. So we were looking at trucks from rental companies out of Anchorage, which were the only ones that had them. And they were like $3,000 for the week. And then we're looking at Turo or these apps and stuff like that. And it's just super cost prohibitive to rent a vehicle. And <laughs> Joe started messaging some people on Facebook to see if we could borrow their car for a week. We went on Marketplace and looked, well, first we looked at buying a cheap truck, like a $1,500 truck, and then trying to sell it before we left, which was probably a bad idea, but it would've been kind of fun. A little risky. Um, and then we started messaging these same people that had trucks for sale in Fairbanks and saying, hey, we'll rent this truck from you for a week, and then you can put it back up for sale. And we got close on a couple of them where they were like thinking about it, and we were 
talking to insurance companies and stuff like that, but it just didn't pan out. So we went this U-Haul route and got a U-Haul truck. We were nervous about them running it to us or someone renting it out the day before we got there, not knowing that we had it reserved or just all these crazy things are going through my head. Like we're gonna have all this effort and all this energy and all this planning going into this and then we're going to be stuck in Fairbanks with no vehicle. That was the biggest fear of this. Or like a lemon of a U-Haul with a jillion miles. Yeah. Yeah. So, but it it worked out. We got there, got our U-Haul and it was a brand new GMC or Chevy with 1300 miles on it. It was four wheel drive. um, Standard cab. Yeah. Standard cab, long box. We fit all our stuff in it fine, but. Had a big fuel tank too. Yeah. Had like a 36 gallon fuel tank. So it was it was really perfect. It was a topper away from being perfect. Yeah, it would be cool to have a topper. It is interesting, speaking of toppers, that there is other opportunities if you budget a little bit more for it and you're a little bit more on top of your scheduling. There is some for purpose built rental companies in the Fairbanks, Alaska, Anchorage area that do like pretty aggressive four wheel drive, like pickup truck builds with bigger wheels, suspension, toppers, tents, yeah. coolers, all the all the bells and whistles. They're a little bit more expensive. They're not nearly as expensive as a rental truck from the airport, but they're expensive. Um, and some of them come like pretty built. We saw some tundras up there that had like the rack system mm-hmm. they're they're pretty awesome they're, but it'll cost you almost three times as much as what a u-haul will and it works so um we got the rental truck worked out great the next thing we had to think about or joe had to think about ahead of time because i didn't buy any um is tags what is the cost to hunt caribou as a non-resident in alaska so you need to have your alaskan hunting license as a non-resident i think it's like 130 to 150 bucks and i bought that the year prior because you need that tag or you need that license to apply for um any draw tag that you'd want to apply for whether it's sheep caribou moose any draw tag you have to have a hunting license for in december of the previous year so on top of that you need to buy the caribou locking tag and all the paperwork that comes with that that you notch out and fill out and that for a non-resident is $650. You can buy it, in, buy it in advance and have it shipped to your house and then fly with it, that's what I did. Or you can land there and go to the Sportsman Warehouse or whatever and buy that locking tag once you get to Alaska. Um, if you buy it with, within the same month of travel, I'd probably just wait and buy it there so it doesn't get lost in the shuffle of mail. If you got it a few months in advance, go ahead and buy it early. Um, I did buy a wolf tag once we landed in Alaska, um, which was 60 bucks. I bought that at Sportsman's Warehouse, and then I bought my uh, seven-day fishing license there as well. So pretty simple. Sportsman Warehouse also had fishing poles for like 20 bucks with bait and stuff or spoons. So like definitely get it because there's a lot of really awesome rivers. Um, so like speaking of like other equipment that you would have got on Sportsman Warehouse too, outside of the tag costs, like we got some things there. You have to get like isobutane there because you can't fly with it. And Western hunters obviously know that. There's like several restrictions you can't fly with. Right. So there's some things that make sense to wait and get once you get there, which obviously isobutane you have to. You can't fly with that. If which to be clear, it, isobutane's for your stoves, for people that aren't. Right. You have a little screw and canister for your stove. Um, if you're gonna carry bear spray, you can't fly with that either. Um, there's a couple other items that I don't typically fly with. Like if I can avoid it, I probably wouldn't fly with freeze dried meals just because they take up a ton of space and a ton of weight. Um, lighters, batteries, simple things that you know you're gonna be able to find once you get somewhere. Which this year again, because of the climate of things is a little bit weird. So we called Sportsman's Warehouse early and said, hey, we're flying in. Are you sitting good on freeze dried meals? Are you sitting good on bug spray? Are you sitting good on just a couple of kind of key items that we wanted to take up there? Or else you're going to be eating jerky and Mountain Dew the entire time. Yep. <laughs> Which would have been fine for you. Anyway. So the next thing also is like to understand like um, there's like several opportunities to hunt caribou in Alaska. Um, obviously the one that we, pref- we took is why we flew into Fairbanks is to take that Dalton highway up. So for 414 miles for 
basically a 10 mile wide corridor centered on that road, the Dalton Highway. Five miles on each side is the archery corridor. So roughly like north of like the Yukon, a little bit further north there actually, I think than that. Um, you can archery hunt off the road, at, like on the east, park on the east, it's archery hunt off the road for as far as you want to hike in on each side. And that first five miles, you're only allowed to use archery equipment. And then past that, that towards that, past that five mile mark, you're allowed to use your rifle. So it's interesting to juggle that too, because you have to be like, it's not like which we figured out and we knew kind of going into it. There's not signs on the road that says like, this is where the corridor starts. This is where the rifle line is. These are uh, control zones that are no hunting. They are not allowed to do it. They don't have like that marked up there. So like you have to have some type of maps or digital maps. In this case, we used HuntWise, which had all the maps for Alaska and will let you know that this is where you can and cannot use this equipment. This is where you can and cannot hunt. And this is where uh, basically to basically know when you're navigating out in the tundra where it's just flat nothingness, where you can and cannot what. Because like game wardens don't care if you do something improper, they're gonna they're gonna get you for it. So you have to right. make sure you're you're safe and you're um, you're following the law. So that's the interesting dynamic. But it also offers that Dalton Highway cuts all the way up to Alaska. That offers an incredible amount of access to hunting the Alaskan wilderness without having to fly into certain select areas all across Alaska or take boats and guides across rivers. Like if you have a vehicle and you have the equipment and you have the know-how to navigate that no hunting and hunting zone and the rifle zone and the archery corridor, you have a lot of wilderness that you can tap with your fingertips to experience that. More than you have time for. Oh yeah. So we literally drove, like you said, 414 miles from Fairbanks all the way clear up to Prudhoe Bay, Dead Horse. And the entire way it's five miles each side archery corridor and i think that's for everything so if you have a moose tag in that area it's the same principle but you go through the boreal forest the koyukuk river you cross the yukon you're starting to see the the big mountains of the attic and pass and the brooks range the north slope and then you're out into the tundra so it's a pretty cool way to see a lot of alaska really the only thing that you don't encompass is like that southern coastal region stuff so um which is re really cool country and have to see that sometime. But yeah, you don't see that on this type of trip. Right. Um, but yeah, the, the corridor is pretty interesting. It's important to know that where you are, like you said, on, on all aspects of it. But So the reasoning that the road is even there is basically to make it so there's um, Prudhoe Bay is where, and like Dead Horse is where the oil infrastructure in Alaska does, our sits for the pipeline, yep. and that's where the operations are. So basically, Dead, um, the Dalton Highway connects Fairbanks and the rest of Alaska and like basically the highway system of the United States to Prudhoe Bay. Um, and there's the pipeline that follows the road all the way up and down. And that's the reasoning for that road. So there's a lot of semi trucks that take that road up and back, and it's like kind of a scary road. It's um, it's rough it's like the pavement is obviously honestly worse than the the dirt is in a lot yeah. of aspects because it's like a mixed use road the spots where it was paved it was so whooped out that there was times where like you could feel it like building too and the suspension it'd just be whooping further and further and further and before you know it our heads are hitting the ceiling and our tires are bowing in and out like this and there'd be sections where there's 30 yards where there's just a hole where the pavement was gone yeah there's a two foot deep hole so you have to kind of navigate around that. And then you get sections where it's just washboarded, nasty gravel. People are losing tires. People are getting stuck. It turns to like this crazy, muddy gumbo when it gets wet. It's, it's a nasty road. We never lost a tire. We never had any issues. And I was honestly shocked about that. But we did prepare for that. We bought extra gas cans in case something happened and you need yep. extra fuel. We bought tire repair kits. If you can find one and you have the budget for it, I would even consider buying, um, if you know your model of wheel, potentially buying a spare. We had one spare that came with the truck, but honestly, especially if it was someone's personal vehicle, I'd have two spares. Um, we saw a lot of built rigs from people that live in Alaska and hunt Alaska quite often and hunt the corridor a lot um, that had pretty built trucks with multiple spares. multiple spares and fuel. And so we were running a little lucky, but... At the very least, a patch kit and then one of those little tire inflators that plugs into your cigarette lighter to get by. Um, we bought four gas cans and filled them up in Fairbanks. And the price difference in gas is pretty substantial. It was like 330 in Fairbanks, so pretty close to what it is at home. And I think it was like six bucks in Prudhoe Bay. Yeah. So we did carry some gas from down south, 
We probably didn't need to take four gas cans though, because there's a stop for fuel right on that halfway mark in Coldfoot, which there it was like 520 a gallon or something, 550 a so gallon. So to iterate on that, when you leave Fairbanks, the halfway point is Coldfoot, and basically Coldfoot's like a little motel and a restaurant and like a fuel pump, and they also have 3G Verizon there. And they have a bar. And they, Yeah, they have a bar. Um, and so you can get fuel there. Um, so you basically have like Fairbanks is fuel, 212 miles later is cold foot, roughly. Like, roughly. Um, there's fuel there, um, which is significantly more expensive than Fairbanks. And then all the way in Purdue, they have fuel, which is also more expensive than it was in cold foot. Um, so you do have full opportunity. We were a little overkill on fuel, but we weren't sure of how that dynamic was gonna work. And we didn't know if we were gonna be hunting between cold foot and Prudhoe. For all we knew, those caribou were gonna be right as soon as we crossed Attic and Pass. They ended up there further north and closer to more fuel, but we could have spent three days driving back and forth and back and forth and needed that fuel. So I don't know actually that that was overkill the more I think about it. That's true. When you do get up all the way to the northern part of the Dalton Highway too, the main no hunting zone on the Dalton Highway is on the oil infrastructure near uh, Prudhoe and Dead Horse. And uh, it's basically like like a refuge, but it's where they were because you can't hunt on there. A lot of caribou know that you can't hunt there and they quite, to be frank, abuse that. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, we saw some pretty, some pretty mature bull caribou um, on the no hunting zone that would actually sit underneath the uh, oil infrastructure buildings there and just let the air conditioning cool them off as yeah. they sit underneath there. But it's kind of like seeing elk that end up on a ranch really early that they know they don't get shot on. Yeah. So you you just and also if you get caught hunting on the no hunting zone, like there's obviously implications for that. You you can't hunt there. It's, it's, don't it, do that. It's not safe either for the people that are on the um, on the fields. Um, so that's basically like most of the logistics that go into this, like basically. Yeah, it's not as daunting as what I think even the film might show. It's, it's very doable. Um, I would definitely get patch kits, get extra fuel, and then plan on some hurdles like oh we should talk about the potential for flooding okay yeah so one one thing that we almost ran into that we didn't well, thankfully hit we barely skipped it we stopped at there's a little outpost station that the state has right by the Yukon River and it's basically one of those places that like you go and you get a pamphlet there's some t-shirts for sale and stuff like that so that cross the Yukon um, there's a lady that works in there and she said hey FYI you guys still have about eight nine hours of driving to go and we have a big weather system coming in where we're going to get three to five inches of rain on this side of Attican Pass of the Brooks Range. Once you cross it, then you have good weather. But we had a lot of dirt roads to drive with that weather coming. And when that Koyakin River floods up, it can actually hit the Dalton Highway and make it impossible to cross. And so. three to five inches of water with road tires on the Silverado on a dirt road going into elevation to climb over the Continental Divide. Yeah, let, well, not Continental. Or, We're a long ways north of that. Um, <laughs> the Brooks Range. The Brooks Range. But um, that's one other thing that we should mention is once you, like, it's probably pretty easy to, once you're driving up Attican Pass and crisscrossing through all that, like, naturally you want to kind of stop and look around and see the sights because it's literally the most beautiful place I've ever seen in my life. There is more than likely a semi truck driver who is shifting gears to get up over top of that thing because if he doesn't make it in that pass he has to back all the way back down that thing and make another run at it don't go slow keep moving because those big trucks can't slow down they need to keep moving to keep that momentum going to get over it's like top pretty unsafe if you're if they can't make it over too and they have to back back down yeah or downshift into first and just try to chug up that road but either way don't get in the semi truck driver's way they're there to work so those are basically the logistics. So like now it's kind of like the gear you need or like the essential gear that we found was like super necessary on our project or our hunt. Um, the biggest thing to start with is like a proper clothing system probably like there's like Alaska is like an incredibly volatile place for weather. Like we saw like fairly nice weather on the front of the week. We saw um, 
a lot of like got really wet. There's one thing you count on with Alaska is it's going to get wet, yeah. and um, so there's weather systems that came in, and the weather is so radical there. Like you'll start out in the morning, it'll be kind of dim and kind of gross, is in our experience, and then all of a sudden it will get sunny for a bit, and then all of a sudden you'll get like crazy wind and rain, and then all of a sudden like a dark like it's like. It's pretty wild. Every day was different. The one thing that I noticed is like you go from the times that we were there, it was like the hot days were 60, the cold days were like high 20s. But they didn't have these big temperature swings from morning to night because it never got dark. So, but it did rain at some point throughout the day, every day. Some days were constant rain. It was almost windy every day. Um, some of the hotter days, you need like a lighter weight of your system where you're just wearing like pants and base layers and like um, gaiters and boots because the tundra is like soaking wet. So you can march through that and make stocks on animals if you're going to play the archery corridor. And then you also need to have like some type of puffy when it gets cold and you're like sitting on the tundra just glassing or on the roads and stuff, especially when that wind picks up and it gets a little later because it cools off in the evenings and it mornings. Definitely gets cold. Um, and then like can't preface this enough, like you'll be miserable if you don't have a rain system a full rain system not yeah. just a rain jacket or like a cheap little fold into a bag rain jacket like good rain gear that's one thing that sets us aside from the elk hunts i've done in the past where i've gotten away with just a rain jacket or no rain jacket at all and just being okay with getting a little bit wet and then letting my clothes dry out you don't have that option here it's not going to dry out everything is just it's humid it's gonna get wet and it's gonna stay wet. Um, the only way that it's gonna get dry is by wearing wet clothes underneath your rain gear and essentially your body heat drying some stuff out. So that changed a couple of things that I would normally do on like a Western elk hunt. I'd usually run Merino on my skin. And because the potential of being wet was so high there, I ran almost synthetic everything just because it dries so much quicker. So, but yeah, um, good rain gear is huge. Gators is huge. And then your boot selection, I think is pretty important for this as well. We had two different brands of boots and really types of boots. Um, I wore a Hanwag Friction, which is a slightly insulated boot, but it's also pretty dang waterproof and it's a taller boot. And then I ran a Gator over top of that and for the most part my feet stayed really dry um it definitely didn't need to be an insulated boot but that could have gone the other way too we could have got snow and i could have appreciated yeah, it yeah, no idea insulated so um typically i'm not a big insulated boot guy but that boot did really well the water i don't even want to understate this like the water in the tundra like the marshy conditions like we would actually use our maps to like figure out plot points that go around the water, like by, like pond, lakes, like things, and then all the marshy tundra areas around it because like it's finding the path of least resistance. You don't completely soak your boots and gear even with gaiters on. Yeah. And also getting as far this distance on like the higher tufts of like tussocks and... Um, but then you hit some points where you just realize we're gonna get wet, we're just gonna march through this thing. Especially when you're on a stock and it doesn't really, like the animal's not really giving you a choice. Yeah, so plan on being wet. It, it's going to happen. It, there's another good point there is the further north that you go, once you cross Attic and Pass, the wetter it gets. The further you stay closer south in the mountains, the, probably the drier you are, the more hills and kind of that rolling tussocksy kind of stuff there yeah. is. It's an extremely hard terrain to describe and it's very different in different areas. If you can walk on gravel or walk on a riverbank, do it. Um, but yeah, there's just gonna be times you're gonna be wet. The, um, we, we camped in the tundra a couple nights, um, especially after we, after Joe shot the caribou and like when we were like trying to get out there far past the five mile corridor, um, past the archery corridor to like start glassing the rifle zone and then play that line of like looking to our right for archery and then looking to our left for rifle opportunities. Um, and we were like fairly worried about this in hindsight, um, just to think about it, if you're like planning on setting up a tent out in the tundra, wind does pick up there, it's flat, there's not a lot of cover, there's not a lot of opportunity. There's like, no cover. Yeah, there's not a lot of opportunity to like hide your tent and shield it. So like the longer curly stakes that can dig real deep in the tundra, I'd probably bring next time. We were shocked that we had a tent when we got back. When we shot our caribou, we were, our tent was four miles in roughly from the road. And then we shot the caribou another six miles past that. So we had 
a six mile hike with the caribou back to our tent and we had some really gnarly winds that night. We were kind of like betting 50-50. I'm like, is this tent actually gonna be there when we get back? Are we gonna lose all of our gear that was in there? Blah, and blah, just blah. to preface that, like it wasn't like distance, distance, like it wasn't from the road. We were that far out in the tundra. It was a little bit of like a J hook. So like not right. only from the road, we weren't that far. We were still in the rifle corridor, but we weren't this exorbitant distance into the tundra. Right, so basically we were five miles in from the road as far as the archery corridor we covered that we're now in the rifle rifle zone whatever you want to call it but because of the amount of water that was between us and the caribou we had to make this giant hook around this water when i say water like a lake yeah it wasn't like we could just march across this thing that thing could have been 30 feet deep for all i know but um so we had this big loop that we had to make around this lake which made it end up being an extra six miles but um we were betting on if that tent was going to be there or not. Thankfully, it was, but definitely take stakes bigger than we did because we had the little MSR, the little were, tiny ones. Yeah, wouldn't cut it. Um, well, just it's not like it's just not smart. You can take longer stakes. You can bet on your tent being there. I just I'll pack those next time if I go back. Or even if like you go to whatever store you go to, a hardware store in Fairbanks, and buy those dog tie-in stakes, something like that. Just something that gives you a little bit more. Because that ground is so soft, it can pull out really easily. Yeah, especially if you have a vestibule that can just catch wind and just tear stuff out. Yeah, maybe that's another good point is I would definitely make sure that you have a good tent and it's very much so waterproof on the bottom because where we camped that night, we literally had standing water touching the bottom of our tent. And I was shocked that we never got wet in there. Yeah, it also makes for a fairly comfortable experience, the tundra, and you don't need like yeah, sleeping mats like and stuff. It's a like a big water bed. Tempur-Pedic. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that's like our tank clothing system. Um, we apply a different strategy. A lot of people that we've seen online and stuff that actually hunt the Dalton Highway for caribou um, often bring like spotters and stuff and sit on the road and throw up spotters and stuff. Um, we wanted a little bit more mobile and lightweight approach for this. And we also like didn't know how far we'd have to punch out or if we wouldn't, how, what we did. So Joe, I think you can speak to like our optic strategy for binoculars and whatnot. Yeah, so basically just with the thought in mind that we are going to both do some archery hunting on the road or within that five mile corridor and potentially go outside the corridor with a rifle we're carrying two weapons or i'm carrying two weapons i've got a 14 pound gun and a bow so i'm already pretty heavy i didn't want to take a spotter i ended up taking my 10 by 42s that i wore in my vinyl harness and then I had a lightweight tripod with a set of 15 by 56s that I kind of used as a spotter. And it worked, I'd say, for 80% of what I wanted it to. There was a couple times where from the road, I could see caribou, like, there's a couple of spots that you can see like eight miles, legit eight miles. And even a spotter at that range, is it's tough to know what you're yeah. looking at. So if you've got the weight capacity in your bag, um, maybe if we weren't filming this hunt, if we took all the camera gear out, we could have ran a spotter, something like that. Yeah, if you can cut back on the obnoxious amount of weight I take for camera equipment, you could probably take better gear. Yeah, so I'd say if you're not filming this or if you have some more leniencies in your weight restrictions, bring a spotter as well. But I, I just so people that don't understand some of that jargon, like the 10 by 42s is like an average, like I can punch in a little bit. Like, like It's a typical what you'd have deer hunting elk hunting on on your chest rig and the and 15 then, by 56 is significantly a little bit yeah so a 15 by 56 is about that big it's probably twice the weight if not a little bit more and those were actually kind of nice as a handheld out of the truck too where i'd roll the window down halfway set them right in on that and was there any like coatings or anything about the 15 by 56 or anything that made it nice or yeah so two different types of coatings actually on the binos that I took. I had just my typical tactical 10 by 42s from Steiner in my pouch. And then we had the Predator LRFs, which are also 10 by 42s. And those had a slightly different coating on it. So colors popped a little bit differently. Same with the 15 by 56s. They're all just the kind of like Sony versus Canon cameras. They all just look a little bit different. And sometimes those colors popping a little bit kind of helps contrast stuff, especially at a distance, so. Yeah. So. Then also, like you touched on the weapons, so I don't know if we need to go back to that. Basically, just having both the rifle and the art and the archery equipment made it so you can play that line and have right. opportunity in both. Um, and then the pack system is there anything specific about your pack system that you did or did not do that you would change in the future besides making it smell really bad? Yeah, well, um, 
we'll touch the weapons first. So I had a Bergara HMR 300 wind mag or B14 with the Steiner 6x4, 6x24x50 Predator scope on it. And the only thing that I would do differently on that is if I'm going to carry two weapons, I would carry a lighter rifle. That gun is awesome to shoot and I've killed a lot of animals with it, but it's heavier than what it needs to be. Um, I would have gone with one of their more lightweight approach style rifles, especially for a hunt that you might not even be using. You might be using your bow the whole time. And then for the bow, I ran my Prime Nexus 4. It's an 80 pound bow, shooting 520 grain arrow. Um, I, I don't change anything with that. That's what I shoot for deer, that's what I shoot for elk. It's just, that's my bow. So, um, yeah, and, but whatever you're shooting is, is great, so. And then pack system? Packs, it? we both ran Kufaru Muskegs. I've ran that pack for six years now, so I've got a ton of faith in it. Um, it's made with X-Pack material, which is waterproof. Super important on this one, especially for you with camera gear. Um, I ran a Sherman pocket on the outside of that, which gave me a little bit extra storage and some quick access into some things. And then you actually ran a lid in addition to your Sherman, but same basic system, Kafaru duplex frame, muskeg bags, some pockets on it. Yeah, and I'm by no means a pro packer, and I'm the farthest thing from an ultralight He hunter. bought the pack two weeks before we left. Yeah, so it, I was, the reason I got it, I was using um, a previous pack, which worked out really nice, and I enjoyed it, and it fit everything. And I actually liked how I got my top loading system for it, and it worked great, um, but I wanted, Alaska, like we said, you can count on being wet. So it was like really important to me to have like that musk egg, that X-Pack material, with all that camera gear and equipment inside of it, it was really nice to know that like I had like a little bit of like peace of mind knowing that all of this camera equipment and lenses weren't getting exposed to the elements as aggressively. Um, so that's the reason why I went for that. And um, my pack was definitely not light, so I'm not gonna pretend like I'm this pro pack or anything, I'm the furthest thing from it. But the reason I also did the Sherman and then I did the guide lid um, was because all of my quick access stuff like lenses batteries and all that kind of stuff I could fit in I fit all my lenses in small easy access ready to use I need to touch it a lot things in my guide lid because zip grab my hand in there It's a big pouch on top It really extends how many cubic inches I have in the top of that pack and I can access things fairly quickly um, And then the Sherman pack is a little bit more organized a little bit more slim so I was able to put like battery packs um, like goal zero battery charging systems any of that kind of thing where I could charge batteries in the field um, access like ND filters I kept a lot of my ND filters in my Sherman packs I need to be able to swap and change things for lenses um, and so I kept a lot of like a quick access things on there and then inside my pack I kept like the tents like um, like lenses and all that kind of stuff because there's that side loading zip around the musk egg so I could quickly grab a lens swap out swap in and I kept all the lenses inside pouches um, and then I also just kept the tripod strapped to the side with my zoom lens, my, and we'll touch, we'll touch base on that later, but so I could quickly just deploy when we were gonna try to make a stock. To clarify, he was way more organized with how he put his stuff in his pack than I was. Mine was basically just, the muskeg is a bucket. I filled things in it, strapped it down tight, and went. Yep. The, um, Cause everything you need to touch is usually on the outside of your yeah, thing. Yeah, so basically like the only thing that would be I'd have to open it for as if we hit a storm or I needed my puffy or something like that. What was in my Sherman was basically my 15s and then my um, tripod was on the outside. So if I needed to pull my 15s out, I could drop them in right away. And then like really important stuff like Skittles. So. Skittles, yeah. is that what you said? <laughs> <laughs> Candy and stuff like that has to stay there in case I get hungry, so. Cause that's the primary food source in the back country is Skittles. Yeah. And those uh, cherry, the tuna packets and the cherry sours. Cherry sours. What was um, those little blocks? Oh, yeah. So um, that's a big thing. Cl yeah. Cliff blocks and then honey stingers. Yes. Are. The cliff blocks, we've, we've done the honey stinger thing, and you've obviously done the honey stinger a lot longer than I have with like almond butter and whatnot. So, um, but I like. They're, I found them kind of expensive, not like being super tied to them or whatever. I went on Amazon and I bought a box of 18 yeah. sleeves of Cliff Blocks that have three, no. Six. 
two, yeah, six cubes in each. So it's like two to three servings per sleeve. Um, and they have like 50 milligrams per serving of caffeine and they have like enough carbs and like uh, protein and various other things to keep you going. So just keep a sleeve in your bino bivy and pop a couple whenever you're- And they taste pretty good. Yeah, they have great flavors. I've, I'm definitely getting them again. So those were those were super key because like when you're getting a little tired on pounding flat ground and stuff, you have a couple of them and you're back to the races, so. Let's touch on the food thing really quick, just what we had. So we grocery shopped a little bit to have some food that we had in the truck. And honestly, it was garbage. Like we shopped like we were college kids. It was <laughs> Doritos, and Mountain Dew, chips. He got sugar-free Baja Blast, which is should be illegal. Yeah, definitely um, not doing that again. Yeah, it was terrible. It's purposeless. Yeah, but <laughs> a lot of just like chips and stuff to make sandwiches and like tuna packets and just stuff. I don't know, we didn't eat that good, but we also had Peak Refuels, Mountain House, stuff like that and then a lot of bars honestly a lot of candy a lot of uh honey stingers almond butter um tuna packets peanut butter bread um also we didn't mention earlier is we did buy coolers for the idea that we're gonna have to pack out an animal potentially we also used them dual purpose so we could put a lot of our food that was like fruit or anything else that needed to be somewhat cool um we could keep you talk like we had a bunch of fruit we had one bag of apples <laughs> Big health guys. Yeah, um, we, we did not eat very well. But we kept all that in there, and also it, it, not even keeping it cool, it kept it dry. Yeah. So, and then also when we needed to, we by the time we actually harvested an animal or killed a caribou, we could like pull all the food out or what's left of it because we were aggressively going through that. And yeah, then, we were pretty much out of food by the time we left. Yeah. Um. So then, yeah, that's pack system. Basically, there's not a whole lot that we realized that you would change equipment-wise from a Western hunt. It's just making sure, like, I know you've gone into, like, Western hunts for elk and stuff where you don't take a full rain suit, and you're like, like, I'm going to just run, like, the jacket when I need it, and, like, cut weight. Um, I, based on what you've seen in West, I don't know, I haven't done a whole lot of elk hunting and whatnot, but I would assume that it was probably worth it to take the rain pants for this. One thing, especially worth it, but another thing to note with this is there is no opportunity to make a fire where we were hunting. There is no fuel driftwood. There is there is not one tree out there. There is literally nothing to burn unless you brought firewood with you. And you're not carrying firewood six, eight miles into that tundra. So uh-huh. there is no opportunity to dry something out with a fire. So um uh, just like battery packs too, like going into this, like I obviously have cameras, we have phones. Like if you don't have your phone working and operating, like you're not gonna be able to see your maps and you don't know where your boundaries are. Um, and then just anything else we needed to charge. Like if it was like, I, my headlamp takes like rechargeable batteries, so I have to plug it in. So like having enough battery too, we had no idea like if we were gonna even, we, we can't, there's no outlets. So like, we don't know when we're gonna be able to charge stuff or not. So we did bring a lot of these like battery packs. Um, Goal Zero makes some really awesome battery packs. They're like um, 100 watts, so you're allowed to fly with. Mm-hmm. Um, if I remember 100 watts, I think that's the spec, but you're allowed to fly with them. They're like below the FAA like rule for lithium grade um, batteries. So we took a couple of those. You can Wi-Fi charge your phone when you're in the field. Um, you can plug into it, charge your phones, charge my camera batteries. I could plug in my laptop on them. They could charge laptops. One of them has an AC 110, um, which was wicked. Um, and we didn't actually get to use them a whole lot. We used them just when we need to, mostly the portable ones to charge our phones. Um, but they were there because we just genuinely had no idea how we were going to go about charging stuff. And we could, t- I could totally see us like just chewing cards, chewing f- footage and like our phones and stuff and not having the ability to charge things. So having this those- is more of a matte thing. Obviously the, the camera filming this adds a whole different element to it. But if you're just going out there, you're not filming this with a bunch of camera gear literally two battery packs i would say it would cover you for the week yeah definitely the little ones that you can get from rei and stuff like Good to go. would, would be fine um kind of just to like for people that watch videos on this or don't see a lot like w- let's just speak to like our experience with caribou like what they let you to do stalking wise and like just our general like obviously we're not experts on this but it is important to note like what our what we came across and how we approached it um, like uh, it's incredible to see like how close you could try to stalk on them and how their behavior was. So you want to speak to that a little bit. Obviously we're not experts on this, but. Right. So, and we kind of said this in the video where it's, you can kind of stalk in plain sight, which you would never dream of doing with a, a white tail or even a mule deer, I would say, but they, um, they're, they're a strange animal. So they're, 
they kind of seem to wander meaninglessly. They just don't have a rhyme or reason to what they do. They're just kind of moving throughout the tundra. Ultimately, they're heading south, but sometimes they're sprinting. Sometimes they're just meandering around. They're feeding. They're pushing their nose into the tundra to get away from the bugs. Um, there's no rhyme or reason to what they're going to do. Don't chase them. If you can get in front of them, do it. If you can't, line yourself up with where they were. And there's probably another group of caribou that are following that same one that you were just after. We ran into that when, when we killed mine. It came right to the same group that uh, the ones before it did. So, But archery hunting, you can be a little bit more aggressive. You can make moves on these animals even when there's nothing to hide behind to a certain point. It seems like once you get within that like 90 to 120 yards, then they get a little bit wary of you and nervous and they kind of bug out. But And sometimes they bug out at 400. You never really know what they're going to do. It's, most of the time they don't even know you're there. It's just more or less like bugs that bother them. It has to fire over to this direction to get away from the bugs. Right. Settles up there for 20 minutes feeding and then fires all the way over here. By the time you reposition to get into a stock again, it's... The point that I kind of want to make with it, I guess, and I'll leave it at that, is be aggressive with them. If you <laughs> don't get that one, there's more coming. Yeah. So that's basic behavior. So basically find them yeah. and try to make plays on them. If, you, if you're hunting off the road, you'll probably get five, six stalks a day, I would say. If you stayed on the road and just drove back and forth and burned fuel, you'd probably get five, maybe, maybe more. I don't know. Especially if you're there for caribou in general and not some... Big trophy. Big trophy. Yeah, mature if you're one. looking for a legal bull. And what is a legal bull? A bull. It's purely based on. Yeah, it needs to have uh, the bull parts hanging below him, and that's what qualifies him as a bull. There's not a antler size. It's a. He's got to have that unit. There was also like, <laughs> we also didn't see a like we didn't see any legal in the zone trophy bulls off the road i'm sure they're there i'm sure they move through in distances but oh, we did it after we killed mine yeah once we went further south we saw some more too so but that being said yeah so our whole goal with this was to find and kill a legal bull caribou that was it yeah and then the first morning i actually passed a bull which i've probably never done in my life but we stocked up on one that was 15 yards off the road and i just didn't feel right i wasn't quite done with what i wanted to do so we passed him and then found one 10 miles away yeah so it was interesting to see the density of other hunters on certain segments of the road and it kind of wonders like if we would approach where we hunted in our area or go to a different area if we did it again yeah but. i won't say where i'm gonna if if i do this hunt next year i won't say where i want to go but i will say that where we ended up hunting is probably not where i would start next year yeah would you agree with that yeah there's plenty of opportunity and it's a long road. Um, so some of the fears and like the prep, like going into this is like, uh, I think one of the biggest things we were worried about, especially like kind of going with that U-Haul, we were worried about getting the U-Haul is also like breaking down on the doll end. Um, if your vehicle fails or you have vehicle issues and you can't solve it by yourself on the road, um, there's going to be um, difficulty getting services out to help you or if you need assistance and stuff yeah. like you're pretty remote. Um, and it's gonna, Put a big damper on your hunt i mean you're, yeah it's not like you're waiting for triple a you're gonna lose a couple hours you're losing days, days and it's gonna be expensive if something breaks that you can't fix yourself so spending the extra 150 bucks to have some equipment in your vehicle to make sure you can gear your vehicle up if something happens well worth the three days or two days or however many time that you're gonna spend on the side of the road waiting that you're, i think i heard someone say that it was 2500 bucks to get towed back to fairbanks yeah. so that was one fear um another I don't know if I'd call it a fear, but a precaution that we took is we both carried handguns because we are in pretty dense grizzly country. We saw a grizzly sign, but we actually didn't see a grizzly while we were hunting up there. I know that's not the experience for a lot of people that hunt that area, that it's pretty common to see them. Um, the only one that we saw was further south, actually south of Coldfoot, just a sound and a cub right by the road. But It's crazy too, because like you think that you'd probably be able to see them coming from very far away because it's like far expanse of flat tundra. But it's crazy because the animals and the caribou too, like as soon as they just drop down, like they're, they're gone. gone. Yeah, they just disappear. So you could be hiking into your kill site to pick up the less re left of your caribou or something or what's left or in the same region as something else. And like it could just stand up or be right there and you would not have any idea it's there. Which was funny because the place that we saw the grizzly track was 500 yards from the kill site. Yeah. And we saw no bear. 
but so grizzlies are there we both carried 10 mils with buffalo bore ammo um we practiced with them prior you can carry bear spray if you want um yeah um like hospitals and like general use like we had like there's not a whole lot of facilities up there in in prudhoe they do have some opportunity they have like a little clinic there but like if you like break your leg or anything like that like we saw a guy that cut his arm pretty good and he said that he was going to Purdue to get stitched up. Yeah. So there is some opportunity to get help if you needed it. But, but we don't know what, what the how much they can offer or whatnot. This twin, we didn't have any experience with it, so we don't know. Yeah. Just don't get hurt. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So then we'll just jump into like camera gear, um, because I have a lot of questions about like reasoning for why I selected things, how we shot it. And uh, basically my methodology was, it's like, I'm gonna run two cameras. One I'm gonna use as a wide angle camera where I can capture like emotional reaction shots or close ups and stuff. And then I'm gonna have another camera with a little bit more of a zoom lens. So like, I had them both on my shoulders, which kind of looks, I kind of looked like Iron Man walking around in the tundra. But I had like a longer telephone. Something like that. <laughs> I had a longer telephoto that I could shoot farther uh, stills and video. And then I had my wide angle lens. And then on the side of my pack, I had a tripod that had my 100 to 500 the the new mirrorless Canon lenses basically my idea was like I'll just take the tripod out I'll set it down in the tundra adjust really fast screw on the body I'll just screw it off my shoulder screw it onto the thing and then instantly I'm punched into 500 millimeters and I also shot at pretty high resolution that camera does like 8k out of the body so then I would basically have the 500 millimeters full frame plus 8k and then I would punch in digitally too so I can get really close to the animal without actually having to be that close to interrupt or be in the same like be close to the stock and kind of let Joe run interrupted and try to make a play on the animal. Um, which worked out well. Yeah, which I'm actually like a big fan of that and I'm gonna probably do that on future hunts that warrant that level of zoom. Um, I ran a mirrorless and an EF camera, which means like I had a mechanical DSLR and then a mirrorless camera. Um, I We have the, the mechanical camera in house at the office, so it made sense to just take that and then I took the mirrorless camera to try to cut back on how many EF lens so I was taking because they're heavier and the camera is also really heavy so like the mirrorless system and all the mirrorless lenses are a lot smaller a lot more compact um, and you could cut a lot of weight I think I still took like six lenses though which if someone else is smarter than me and wants to narrow that list down I'm all for it but I just decided to carry all the weight and switch lenses so I had like 16 to 35 on my man body I had the um, 70 to 200 on the mirrorless camera the 100 to 500 up on the um, tripod and then I kept a macro lens and then a couple primes 50 millimeter prime which I shot my interviews on and uh, I think one other lens like blanking on right now inside the pack that like if use case required and we had the time I would switch to usually just for like art purposes not really for um, functionality. Um, I took a bunch of batteries, but I think I had six batteries for my mirrorless camera and then I had three batteries for my 1DX, but the batteries are so much bigger than the 1DX, you don't need as many of them. And then we got the, uh, we, Goal Zero, um, we used those Goal Zero battery packs and we brought those in case we ran out of battery and we wanted to hot charge stuff in the Tundra because we just had no idea what our complexity of what we were going to be doing was or if we we're going to make it back to the car, if we needed to charge my laptop to dump footage. Um, I took like five 512 gig cards, so shooting at full resolution and log formats, like you can eat cards pretty fast. Um, and we also took a drone, and um, people that are familiar with drones and hunting, there's obviously some legality there that you need to look into. And uh, we actually didn't film with the drone the entire way up or even in the tundra at all. We only pulled the drone out after successful harvest, our successful hunt. And then um, as we were driving back to get some cool shots of the environment and stuff, because well, I can't remember, do you remember what the rule is for flying drones and It's animals? similar to that. Of ba basically, to be safe, you just don't fly, period, before or during your hunt. Um, I think it's similar to flight laws where, just like if you were to fly into an area in Alaska, you can't hunt for 24 hours or until the next day. I think the drone laws are the same as that, but just to be safe, we just flat didn't fly it until we killed something yeah just no reason to even yeah. even try to trip ourselves up with that we just no drones until after after the hunt was over and we were no longer in right. pursuit of anything just be safe um i'm pretty sure it's like you can't fly for 24 hours prior to the hunt but it just wasn't right. worth messing with um in the field we had a little bit of a, um a panic attack like on like pretty early in the hunt almost like i think it was opening day 
Um, but yeah, it was opening evening. You had a full on meltdown. That's yeah, my uh, shotgun mic and my camera failed. The actual cable that plugs into my microphone port and the side of my camera to the shotgun mic on top of the camera. Probably a $3 piece. Yeah, super cheap, but it's not like you can buy them there or replace them in Prudhoe or anything. Failed, so I actually did not have a shotgun mic the entire time that we were filming the project because I think a little bit of like, either it was like twisting the cable or failure cable or moisture, moisture or some random thing, but like bring backup microphones or make sure you have backup audio. I just ended up using camera audio for all the things and just played a little bit with the audio in post. And then I had lav mics for all our interviews, which was my crutch in this case. Um, so I'd bring a backup microphone. There's no reason, bad audio means bad project. So if you do something like this from like a filmmaking perspective, just make sure you had the, um, some safety like nets built into that. Um, but anyways, it's like most of our questions. We just have a couple questions from like that people asked online or like a couple things that we didn't cover with like the general list that people asked that were like special cases and um, we'll tackle those. There's only a few. Um, the first one was like somebody asked me how like how hard this project was to film. Um, I mean, it was it's 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 difficult because it's unknown and like you're kind of like we're we're going about it like we had an idea we set up our pre-production like we were thinking about how we want to do we had our angles nailed we had a general outline and kind of story arc of how we wanted to go about it but like we didn't know like um like the difficulty or complexity hence we went a little bit overkill on batteries and cards and like um also trying to set up like we've never hunted caribou before so like how do we show them on camera how do i try to get stocks how do i get these various things mm -hmm. um and so we had to like kind of come up with it as we go and we basically came up with the tripod with the camera on the lens and just drop and go and ready to rock which is part of the fun and honestly you kind of learned that trick like on the bear hunt yeah you came up with that while we were there and we had kind of a debacle switching from the dslr to a camcorder because the first shot was at like 600 and then it ended up being at 80. so having that ready was something that you learned along the way and the, when we did that on the bear hunt i had a camcorder and like the regular camera like joe said but the color sciences were all different the quality of footage was all different so i just wanted to get two cameras that ran similar sensors or similar frameworks that color matched look good together and that's why we went to this and actually the high resolution and the longer zoom lens made it so i could punch in significantly further than the camcorder could even with yeah. like the adapters so like that's going to be like probably my go-to in the future and not that I know anything about cameras, but I think that footage looks better than a camcorder. Oh, for sure. Um, so yeah, then uh, then someone asked like how many cameras and lenses, and what am my strategy to carry them? Um, I basically just took like I think it was like six lenses and two cameras. I mounted one on a Peak Design clip, and then one on the Cotton Carrier. Um, I go back and forth on these things. I think the Peak Design clip's better. The Cotton Carrier is nice. It's faster, um, but it. I've had a couple tear and um, the peak is definitely the way to go and they just don't have a lock so if you bend over really fast or if you trip and fall which I'm prone to do um, you your camera falls out into the ground so um, which also happened yeah and then I guess the the grand one is like what was the total cost for the project and um, how much it is for someone to do themselves so yeah there's a couple of them that we can probably nail to maybe even before that there's, um, let me just pull it up real quick. Um, how much did it cost to get the meat home and how did you get it home? So we literally just deboned everything and froze it um, back in Fairbanks. We got a motel on the front and the back end of this trip. Um, I think it was 130 bucks both times, maybe even less. Um, Golden North in Fairbanks has a giant freezer. I recommend those guys a ton. Yeah, super nice people. Yeah, amazing. Um, so we froze all our stuff there, literally froze the cooler so it started cold, duct tape it. We had 78 pounds of deboned meat and we flew that back home. It cost, it should have cost $270 for some reason they didn't charge us for it, but it should have cost $270. Um, do you need to be an American resident to hunt in Alaska without a guide? I didn't know this question, I looked it up. Yes, you do. So if you are, they, they categorize it as an Alaskan resident, a non-resident of Alaska, or a um, alien non-resident. And if you're Canadian, you're an alien non-resident, and from what I understand, you cannot hunt without a guide. So, kind of sucks. Um, cost of the tag, 650, we talked about that. 
Plus the base. Plus the base, so another 130, 150 bucks. Um, another question was, are there any other species that you can hunt in Alaska without a guide? Uh, yes, so there's blacktail, um, there's units you can hunt moose, uh, black bear, I mean, there's a ton of stuff that you can do. Really, basically the only stuff you can't do without a guide is doll sheep, mountain goat, and then big bear, so brown bear, Kodiak, grizzly. Um, is this the most physically demanding hunt that you've done? I don't think so. No. And I think we probably made it a little bit harder than it even needed to be. So if you're in not great shape, you could literally hunt that road up and down. We saw some big boys doing it. And have a fun time. And have, honestly, that might be a better opportunity. <laughs> I, I really believe that. I if, if you just stay on that road the whole time, cruise it up and down, I think that's actually a really good chance of killing one. Um, that's how the guys that we saw that do it a lot do it. Yeah, that's how the majority of you guys do it. Um, and we've gotten a bunch of questions. I've tried to keep on answering them, but I'm hoping that this is something that people can kind of just turn to and say, hey, here's um, kind of a laundry list of things that we need or things to think about. We also carried bug nets that I don't think we ever used. But we also, I don't think we got a really big brontal of warm weather with aggressive bugs. Right, yeah. So there's, I've seen, and we had some times where the bugs were bad, but it wasn't like unbearable. I've heard it can be unbearable up there. Um, but all in total cost for this project, we figured we had, and this is a rough number, but 4,500 between the both of us. That's flights, tags, rental, food. That doesn't include gear. So this is, if you're a guy who has elk hunting gear, buy good rain, a rain system. For 4,500 bucks, you and a buddy can go do this. So I figure with what Matt had into rentals probably for the camera, he could have bought a tag instead. Um, that's food and a hotel on each end. Mm -hmm. So somewhere between 22 and 2,700 bucks a person. And that's doing it pretty comfortably too. And now given we like had some fun in Fairbanks and other things like just trip expenses that you can add on in your own leisure. Yep. You don't have to like, um, or like extra, like if you do other hotels or anything or extend your trip, like that's all on you. But if you wanted to like you go out there and I'm going to hunt caribou and I'm going to do it like super cost effectively and like really purpose driven, like you can definitely do it for $4,500 between two people. Between two people. And that cost honestly goes down. Say you go with three guys and you split the vehicle up three ways. Mm -hmm. It's for realistically it's one of the cheapest hunts to do i think that's a good point too like we did see a lot of groups with more than two people yep. um and their success rates for their larger groups were also fairly good we saw more people leaving with caribou than did we see anyone not get a caribou no i think it's a pretty successful i don't think hunt. we did i think everyone got one yeah i mean a lot of them were smaller but we saw a old lady and his wife or an old man and his wife and they both shot giants yeah like mega giants so they're there um i can't think of anyone that i've even like gotten their number and talked to after that who didn't get one so the, all the interesting thing too is like i had some questions that are asking about like shooting and shooting times and shooting light and all these things um in that time of the year for this type of hunt you can hunt 24 hours a day opening day was at 1201 like we hunted at midnight i shot that bull at what 10 30 at night mm -hmm. so it never gets dark it's very strange but yeah that's all i think we had right yeah and if you guys can I'm, I'm gonna do the best that i can i'm sure matt will too if you have questions on this feel free to ask them um we'll do the best that we can about um uh, answering those and hammering them back to you but we just kind of noticed that throughout the YouTube comments and the messages, we were seeing the same thing over and over and over again. So we thought this might be helpful, but. We also hope it like some of these things will like easier um, mentality about this or like pretty much reduce those barriers. So if you're like at all even interested to go do something like this, especially with like Western hunting in general, you just have to like buckle up and then just decide I'm gonna go do it. Yeah, just go, you figure it out. And honestly, in the grand scheme of things, I don't find that this hunt was really more physically demanding or mentally challenging than anything else that we've done. It's just the logistics of getting there was a little bit different. That bear hunt was pretty hard though. <laughs> First day. <laughs> that was fine. So, but yeah, it's, it's not impossible. It's something that anyone can do. 
yeah we hope you guys find some merit in some of these things and i'm again thanks for watching the film we appreciate you guys taking a look at it yeah. and hope you guys are like at all interested in maybe expanding beyond what you're used to or what you consistently are doing with hunting and kind of look for some more opportunity that something like on this caliber you know that now it's cost effective and what goes into it that you consider doing it and like we said we're not expert i'm especially not um i don't not gonna speak for joe but like we're not experts on caribou hunting we're not experts on this type of thing in general but we had a lot of fun doing it we learned things a couple along the way and and we talked to a lot of guys up there on the road that this was their first time doing it or their their second year or something like that and it's it's something that I feel like every hunter should check off your list. It's there's not too many other circumstances where you can literally drive to the Arctic. You can drive to the Arctic. You don't have to get flown in. It's and anyone can do this. Anyone can look at their life and say, "I'm going to go to Applebee's less," or "I'm going to cancel my Netflix," and over the course of three years, save up twenty five hundred bucks and go do this. It's so much. Like there's so much to be gained by just going and doing it. And it's a great way to see a lot of Alaska. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we will definitely be back. All right, guys. Well, if also if you have watched this and you were learning about like caribou hunting in Alaska in general and you haven't seen the project, like love it if you wanted to go watch Average Joe. Go it's check a, it out. It's a DIY Alaskan caribou hunt, and it was a ton of fun to do. Like, thanks again to all our partners and everybody that contributed to the project. Yeah. And um, we can't wait till we can go back to Alaska. Next time. Take it easy.